I'm Wendy Rahamatan. Welcome once again to Indigenous Bites. Well, today's show is very special for me because we're dealing with coffee, a real favorite of mine. And today we're on the coffee estate of Mr. Floyd Homer, and his estate is located on the Caparo Brasso Valley Road. So we're here with Floyd, and Floyd is going to take it away. He's on a beautiful multi crop estate. Hi, Floyd. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. I'm very excited about the show. Um, so tell us all about yourself. Um, how did you get into coffee? All right, thank you, Wendy. Um, well, actually, I grew up on a cocoa coffee estate um, since I went dinosaurs room it actually. Um, so I've been around for a bit. <laughs> I don't think so, but. <laughs> and um, so I had some grounding in that on the estate of my grandparents on the Toko Road. Um, okay, so that was in the north of Trinidad. Yes, northeast of Trinidad. Um, so when I got this estate, it used to be citrus, but there was there were two major problems here. One is theft. You know, they would come with gangs and trucks and rip out the gate and, you know, in one night, they'd, you know, steal out most of the citrus. Yeah, that's the other really things sad. too, in terms of the money to maintain the abandoned citrus estate, um, the citrus, there were a lot of citrus diseases and other problems. So you'd find every year, if you try to rehabilitate, you'd have like 20% losses of trees. So it didn't make sense. So coupled with that challenge and the, the grand theft, um, I decided to get into something. What can I put that people wouldn't steal? And um, thinking long and hard, uh, I came up with the idea of going back into coffee because who going to steal the coffee, pick it out, and then put it to dry for six yeah, weeks before they, they can they sell it? They don't even know what to do with that. So, so it, yeah, it becomes a, a problem because few people buy coffee, um, coffee beans, um, un unhulled or hulled local coffee beans. We've lost much of what we did in coffee in the past because up to i think it might have been the 1968 i recall we used to produce about three million pounds of coffee and by 2007 we would just do about 300 um, thousand pounds of coffee so you know. there were vibrant coffee estates up to up to the 60s yes up to the 60s probably um, yeah and it started to decline rapidly after for a range of reasons um, coffee didn't have much of a price people were getting into more cocoa but also people were getting into less risky crops because labor started to become a major challenge for most of the old estates where people moved either into the petroleum or they to move into the government projects right. and then people started converting land to other uses is when they didn't have labor or they found that the management systems we used then didn't lead to a productive and sufficiently profitable estate so so that's that's what happened to the demise of coffee generally and so, other crops. So um, coffee is not is you think coffee is indigenous to this area or who you thought brought coffee was it the um, Central Americans the South okay, Americans so brought coffee here? It was first introduced into the Caribbean in Martinique by the French and um, they was, started. Was that with the enslaved and the workers or well, you think well it was introduced it, them, no, it was introduced by the, the French planters well okay. of course they they call them French planters but they were the landowners the, yes. the colonials never really planted the slave labor planted but um, you also found when they introduced it into Martinique first in the Caribbean um, what you had with in Trinidad with the Spanish colonial government then with in 1783 I think it was with the sedulia of population mm -hmm. where they allowed Catholics and even French Catholics to come to Trinidad to do agriculture and to settle so they got concessions on taxes and wages right. and labor and, and land and so on. So the French planters, the French Catholic planters coming through the schedule of population, the settling Trinidad would have brought coffee plants with them to establish okay. coffee plantations here from, you know, right, just I after got it, yeah. 1783. And, and that was Ar Arabica? That would have been some of the Arabica varieties right. that they were growing at that time in, in, in uh, Martinique and Guadeloupe and in French territories. And, um, I know, um, well, I have limited knowledge on the history of coffee, really, but I know Robusta has been associated with local coffee more than Arabica. Yes. How did that find its way here? The Robusta coffee was actually introduced um, sometime after I would think it was 1920s, but there was there were evidence of it growing in Trinidad experimentally first at the Botanic Gardens, which include all of Saint Clair um, in those days and the research station. And right. between um, 18, I would say 1875 and 1878, the first set of coffee that were produced they were sent to England 
to verify its quality and when they found it was good it was given out to the planters in Maraval and St. Anne's Valley. So in those days that is where much of the coffee yeah, were initially right. grown and then it was distributed elsewhere. But your estate here is what 45 acres? Yes. And um, so how have you managed to transform it from the citrus into what it is today? Because exactly what do you have growing here? Okay so basically to diversify one's risk one should use many different crops of course. and an intercropping system you know reduces the the incidence of pests if you have a monoculture and other problems you would get pests and diseases again, yes yeah. and you have to understand what kind of crops might be compatible with what and i find wow. um, tree crops are generally a lot easier to grow and maintain than vegetable crops and so on and because i grew up into tree cropping system in the, on the Toke Road, that's what I'm familiar with. So I decided to convert from the citrus to, to basically coffee, timber and a few other fruit trees, coconuts and so on as well. Um, so here I have about uh, nine varieties of Robusta coffee and four varieties of Arabica. Now, in Trinidad, from my research, I've found that we have at least 21 varieties of of coffee that's been here, you know, for the last 150, 200 years or so. I know the last time I was here, I saw lots of different um, crops. Like I saw you had ruku growing, yes. and um, there were reasons why you planted some to shade the coffee okay, trees. Okay, so in the in the early stages of growth, coffee requires uh, some shade. Coffee could also tolerate direct sun because I visited estates in Costa Rica and I saw full shade, semi shade and no shade coffee growing in Costa okay. Rica as well. So here I went back to first principles and you can see above us here we have immortal trees. So I use right. immortal as shade. I also tried with ruku as well. I found in the dry season particularly the ruku tolerated the drying conditions here quite well. Right. So I use ruku as shade and another part I also use timber. So I have some upper mat crapo and mahogany growing on other parts of the essay to provide the early shade. And I use a wide enough spacing. What you would notice here too is that the, the spacing between the rows of trees are a little bit wide to make it easier to maintain with a tractor. So you re reduce the dependence on manual labor and reduce your cost. I get it because yeah, it's all planted in rows coming yes, down. Yes, so it's easy for the tractor to drive between rows. And, and so you've had this estate since about 10 years, you said 20, 13? Uh, 14 years. 14, oh, 14, yeah. okay, so, yeah. sorry about that. Um, so these trees were planted then, these are 14 year old or you keep replanting every no, year? No, so the coffee here basically started about uh, five years ago. Okay, so it's relatively five to six years new. Ago. Yeah, so the coffee here is relatively new. So tell me from when you plant a, a seedling to bearing fruit like this, um, how long does it take? The like first this? bearing from planting the seed, it takes from setting the seed to the time the coffee goes out in the ground is one year. My den is just about half a meter tall. And you get And then from that now? time it's planted out three years to get the first coffee bearing. But it's very light because okay. the trees are, are very small. So, about so four in five years, years you'll start to get a decent bearing. So these trees behind you know, these are about uh, five years old. And what type is this? This, this is, is one of the robusta varieties. The robusta tends to have much larger leaves. The arabica tends to have smaller leaves. And they all have a lot of... Um, the veins, veins yeah, that's, yeah, some coffee, the veins are very noticeable in some of the Arabicas. Smaller leaf, the veins, <coughs> excuse me, are not as pronounced. Yeah, so I yeah. see you have different names. You have Talparo, you have Rio Claro, you have Santa Cruz. Those yes. are different brands that you brand your coffee. Yes. Um, what's, it, what's the difference? Okay, so why I, the different names? So before the coffee it was produced on this estate when I started experimenting with coffee in 2013 when I brought out the brand Cafe Vega. So I started buying coffee from a few of the older estates and in Talparo was the first estate actually that I got. Wow. Roselac was the next place and what I found that the coffee grown there and the, the variety at that particular location had its own distinctive mild sort of cocoa chocolate kind of See there you go, we go back to what we were saying before, the right. flavours that it's, come out. It's the variety. Right. Right, it's not necessarily the location yes. because the guy grew it among citrus. Yeah, it's but variety. it had this heavy cocoa sort of chocolate kind of note. Yeah, which is lovely, so I love that. So any coffee that I got that had the same profile or similar profile it's called a talparo same thing the first set that i got from rio claro had its own distinct more sort of nutty kind of flavor you know so anything that any other coffee from elsewhere in trinidad 
of the similar variety as the same thing will be also be called Rio Claro. So that, that's how the name arose from where I got the first one that had this distinct So one is profile. chocolate, one is nutty, what, and what's spicy. the Santa Cruz? The, the Santa Cruz tend to be, have a hint of spicy note as well. Hmm. That's yeah. very and then there's, interesting. And there's also the espresso roast, there's also the premium roast, and there's also the fermented coffee. So these are things we'll explore later when we talk about roasting. Yeah. It comes naturally to us, unstoppable energy. We share it. We use it to live better. We are manifesting a green and sustainable future. NGC, pursuing sustainability at the forefront of energy. Okay, so it's all about berry to bag today. So we're just on the co um, coffee estate and we're here at Floyd Homer's Roastery where it all happens after you've picked your coffee beans. So you yes. bring them here and you either, you said there were two processes, you have a wet process and a dry process. Okay. So traditionally in Trinidad, what we do, we've done the dry process. So you right. pick the coffee berries, you put them to dry, mm -hmm. and then you take it to somebody that has the hulling machine to take out the shell, and then the, the shell beans are then sold and roasted, yeah? Those There's are also green beans, right. green coffee beans. Yeah. Well, the, Countries in Latin America that do the wet process call it green beans because the Arabica varieties okay. they use look greenish. When oh, they, I and get most it. of them do the wet process. Here, our coffee berries, uh, after hulling, drying and hulling, looks sort of brownish tan color. So it's not right. really green. So here in Trinidad, it's not known as green beans, okay. it's just known as right. dried beans. And there's a distinction in the color, the robusta as well. So, so the wet process. Um, used by very few people here uh, on a limited scale. So it's where the ripe berries, mm -hmm. after harvesting from the trees, are brought in and then they are put in water to ferment for 36 to 48 hours and then right. they're taken out and put through a deep pulper. Takes out the skin and most of the pulp. And then what remains is called the parchment coffee and that is dry and that usually dries faster than the berry when it has all the pulp and beans. So that will dry in about two weeks if you have good sun and then you, you, roast, you, you put it through the hulling machine then to take, it, take out the parchment, which is a thin layer on right. the, the, the bean or the seed mm -hmm. itself, and, that is, and then you roast that. Now, you get two distinct pre flavor profiles. The dry process gives you a much richer, bolder flavor right. than the wet process. Than the dehydrated, yes. Yeah. Dehydrated stuff always does. Yes. So, um, but they, with all the estates we have currently, or the ability to grow coffee, I mean, we have a lot of abandoned estates, you say smaller estates. Do you think we could, could rejuvenate those estates to become sustainable and be able to actually export coffee? Because a lot of the beans that we're getting in these fancy coffee shops today are all imported beans, right? So can we comfortably, you think? Well, there are two dimensions to that, that question. One, people in Trinidad, particularly those who have some affluence always seem to believe that what from foreign better so you'll see all these fancy packaged coffee um, and because it, it's expensive or it comes in fancy packaging from a foreign country they prefer that to the local coffee so that's one thing and then if people have grown up liking these foreign roasted flavored coffees no you, you don't really flavor high quality beans you flavor yeah. the mm -hmm. cheaper coffee but that's another or issue. the powdered instant right and some people just like the instant basically for convenience so that's one dimension in terms of preference the second thing is some local roasters who traditionally pass have been roasted small quantities tend to over roast the coffee mm -hmm. and you get it either this this bitter dark kind of thing with not too much flavor and you could even taste the burnt taste so so that has destroyed as well um, people's um, ability to really enjoy a cup of local coffee so you have that and the second thing is in terms of the production end now yes we can rehabilitate the estates to manage it if we can have the adequate labor and if we can have the adequate access to markets and because yeah. the problem is if you don't have because a farmer knows how to grow and produce things 
a farmer is not a marketing person, a farmer is not into mm -hmm. um, downstream processing. So you need to have that linkage between the primary producers and the marketeers and the manufacturers and the processors. If you don't have such strong linkages, it minimizes how how profitable your enterprise can be and the risks you would face as a producer. Well, I mean, if you look at how um, successful the cocoa industry has become, I mean, coffee, I think, is a good sister to, to cocoa. And you're saying that we can grow this really good quality that's that's wanted only or required or enjoyed in the foreign yes. market. So, mm -hmm. in other words, we can, if we put our minds to become more sustainable in our coffee and increase our exports. So let's go into... Um, Roasting the coffee now. Yes. You want to show me a little bit of the green beans and then show okay, us how so I'll show you, you what roast the, it. What the unroasted coffee looks like in our variety. And here today, I have, I will show you from the SD today and the trees you were looking at. These oh, beans okay. came from that SD. So from those these trees. are robustas. Yes, robustas. Right, yeah. okay. Good. So this is the beans. Uh, these are the beans mm -hmm. from the SD. So it doesn't smell anything like roasted coffee. No at all. <laughs> all right. So this is what some people refer to as green beans, but as you can see, it really green isn't coffee. green. Right. It's a lot smaller than most of it the arabicas. It is much smaller than right. the arabica. But Arabica. you know, they say good things come in small packages. <laughs> this is How the unroasted industry, beans. Right. And this goes into the roasting machine here. So we would start it up, let it reach the operating temperature. So what are you doing, a medium roast, a dark roast? Right. So it depends. I don't roast and put down coffee. I roast coffee only on request. So when I have an order or two, right. I would then roast it. So people roast want medium, demand, they right. want one dark and then one espresso roast. So that, those are three different profiles that I do. And now different varieties of coffee roast differently because the beans, the density of the bean is quite different. Okay. So some beans roast faster, some beans roast slower. So yeah. how do you do? How do you Trial know and what error, to do? you oh. figure out that. So in the first time, I you know I burnt a lot of batches of coffee. Okay. And the arabica beans roast almost like 30, 40 percent faster than wow. the robusta beans. Okay. So, so you can burn them quite easily if you've not experienced roasting the arabica beans. Right. Right. So this coffee mm -hmm. would go in the beans would go into here. It's called the hopper, and it goes into the roasting pan. Right. And once that goes in, temperature heats up at, at a maximum of 221 degrees centigrade and it roasts here. Depends on the amount of coffee you put in here, the density again. Usually within 10 to 15 minutes, a batch will roast. Once that is roasted and it's completed here, and you would see it would be ejected in there. So if you realize what we have here, Beans are released in the drum and you can see them being roasted there. Alright, cool. Um, just a test the roast as well. You can get a sense oh, by right. color whether it's ready or not. Yeah. So it's a visual inspection as well to verify based on time and the color. And when it's finished here, this is where it comes to cool. So the roasted beans comes in for there mm -hmm. for cooling. And once that is cooled sufficiently, then we eject it into there. So I will show you momentarily how we do with that as well. And once that's cooled. So this is all mechanized? Yes. So how long will this whole process take? About 10 to 15 minutes. Pretty cool. But the key to all of this is understanding when it is the right roast to bring out the best flavor expression in that particular variety of coffee. I think that's what's the difference. So it comes in not just only science, but also an art as well. Yep. So it's a mixture of science and art. So these are medium? Right, so these are a medium dark. Medium dark. And you can get the aroma in that now, yeah. quite different. Mm -hmm. So this was really from a batch. Um, <laughs> to what I would call my, my premium roast. And that's what goes into the bigger bag for a particular client. So the premium roast is done by the wet process. Okay. Then it's aged for a year. 
And then you take it out and roast it after yeah, a year. I can, I can smell it. It's very um, rich smelling. You're right. And then after a year, then it's roasted and then bagged. So this premium roast, I have one corporate client who takes this exclusively and this is served only in their boardroom for their directors. Okay. <laughs> and they have had coffee from all over the world, but they seem to prefer this compared. So that's reassuring. Floyd, well, let's make about two cups of coffee. So we're going to roast these beans now. Yeah. So there are different roast styles according to if you're doing a French press or an espresso. Yes. A grind, sorry. Grind. Yeah. So, but if you're doing an ex espresso, I, I would do an espresso roast, which okay, is. Yeah, and that would be a very fine grind, right? Right. So a very fine grind. So the machine can adjust or whatever grind depends so on what you want to extract. A French press. Right. So that will okay. be what's often a medium to a coarse grind. Right. So we're doing so two we'll cups. So we'll set that. So, so if you're doing two cups right. with the robusta coffee, it's recommend for a full flavor cup you would do at least 10 grams for an average cup. You know, some people like it stronger, they might put right. more. So you're looking at 10 grams of coffee okay. per cup. Right. So here we're going to do um, 20 grams okay. because it's going to be two cups, right? Cool. So we set it here, so that's 70, 10, 80, 90. So that would be for 20 grams. That's 20 grams of coffee. Okay, so we good. want to grind that. Mm -hmm. So we put it. Tiny amount for that big roaster. Calm grinder, sorry. Yes. Um, but this makes my life easier. So before you set the grind, you need to have the machine on because these are burr grinders. Right. So okay. I will set it here for a medium cost with the extraction. And then. That's it. It's wrong already. Alright. So here mm. you go. Ground mm. coffee. 20 grams. Oh my god, it smells so great. So let's go and make some French press coffee. Okay. So today, Floyd, we're going to make some French press black regular coffee and I'm going to do a Vietnamese coffee. So you have it all set up here. What it is is that the coffee has to be filtered into the glass mm -hmm. so I'm going to take my scoop right now I think that's just about enough for one a bit more. this has to be really strong right mm -hmm. okay. so we're gonna pour some water very slowly in here and I'm gonna leave that to drip down a bit and whilst that's happening we'll do our French press so we put the rest of the coffee into here. And, and people don't seem to realize that when you're making coffee, you're not supposed to use really, really hot water either. That's correct. You know, yeah. you use, um, but believe it or not, these kettles come with special... Um, Thermometers as well. Yeah, so you can do put it on a French press setting. So you stir. And then we want to leave this for about four to five minutes. Four minutes, two to four minutes. But I like four minutes because I like yes. to have my coffee nicely brewed and I like it strong but I have it black as well so while this is happening talk to us about this cupping okay so method you were talking about earlier what what is done and, and it's a protocol used by the specialty coffee association it's called a cupping protocol so mm -hmm. they are very clear and precise directions of, of the procedure that you use and there's a scoring sheet that looks at the acidity the flavor the aroma you know a whole range of different parameters right. And what you do once the coffee is in, this is the container that they actually use, and this is mm -hmm. the spoon that you actually use. So you put the coffee grounds, you pour the, the hot water in, and you leave it for two to four no, minutes. No, you don't stir it. No, you don't stir okay. it. The crust comes off, you gently remove the crust that yes. forms, and you discard mm -hmm. that. And then you just take up a spoon and, and you slurp it. it. Okay. The reason for slurping is that you're pulling the air through it right. and has it scattered around the different tastes portions of the tongue that can differentiate different flavors to determine, you know, the characteristics and the flavor of yeah, that I'm coffee. Try that so when you hear it sloping, that's, that's not bad man. That's, <laughs> that's the way to get it aerated in your mouth to bring out the best um, flavor notes that you can find in any particular type of coffee. Right. So this is drip through now. So I'm going to remove that. Sure. And Vietnamese coffee is basically coffee with condensed milk. Okay. So you put a good bit of condensed milk in there. Okay. 
I'm going to stir that up. Yes, I use a chopstick to stir my coffee. So because it's Vietnamese? <laughs> <laughs> yes, probably, because it's wooden. And we grab some ice. Drop that up. And you know what goes really well with coffee? Cocoa bitters. Oh, really? Yeah, it does. It's really quite amazing with coffee. Mm -hmm. And the only place I get cocoa bitters is from Angostura. Yeah, Trinidad. another sustainable company that's doing wonderful things. You should try it when next time you have your coffee or your cocoa tea. Mm -hmm. Try the cocoa bitters. So that looks yummy. And I think this is about time to pour this out now. a little bit for you too. Of course I made a little mess in the cup. Let me clean that up. A little bit of it does. Cheers. Thank you. Let's see how this tastes. Mm, that's really good. Freshly roasted, you can really taste it. And you sit back, relax, and enjoy the flavor. I like my coffee black. I don't put anything in it. So yes. anyway, cheers up. See you next time. Mm -hmm.